Then now the next uh, talk uh, is uh, uh, from uh, Alicia Formen from Valencia. Alicia Formen is associate professor at the University of Valencia, the, uh, working in, 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 the, in my group in the IC Mall in the Institute of Molecular Science. And then she's uh, going to come back again to the spin crossover materials. And then the, the, the topic now is to try to, to study how spin crossover materials influence the properties of 2D materials. In particular, in this case, uh, will be semiconductors, molybdenum disulfide and systems like, like this one, in which you, can, you will see how uh, the spin switching can be sensed using this kind of systems. Okay, then, Malicia, is your, your story. Yeah, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for the introduction. So. Uh, I'm going to, do, to make a bit a small spoiler about tomorrow's talks because we, I'm going to talk about two-dimensional materials and how we can use molecules to modulate them and to play and what is the interest of that. So first of all, I will go really a quick introduction about that. You already know that we have uh, materials that are stacked layers that can be separated and then when you get ultra thin layers, uh, these 2D layers, we get really interesting and new properties due to the confinement of electrons in the two dimensions due to the large surface area. But we know this for graphene, from graphite, but there are of course a lot of inorganic materials that have increased the interest on two dimensional materials. And among them, the, we are especially interested in these families of compounds that are metal calcogenized, that present different crystallinities, structures, and a plethora of different properties. Among, and among them, on transition metal decalcogenides. These transition metal decalcogenides also are stacked layers like graphite, but each of the, and the interaction between the layers are van der Waals interactions, but inside it, each of these layers, we have a sandwich, a sandwich formed by, by a transition metal between two calcogenides. <clears throat> if we combine different transition metals and different calcogenides, we get materials that have different uh, properties, semiconductors, superconductors, paramagnetic, diamagnetic, and so on. And even inside one single material, we can get different properties depending also, for example, on the thickness. Uh, among all these systems, the most famous one is molybdenum disulfide that I'm going to use it today in my talk. As it's a mineral, so you can find it in in the nature, and but you can synthesize it. You can buy kilograms of it because it has been used for several years because as a, a dry lubricant due to this multi-layers system. But what we are interested is in exfoliate it to get it ultra thin layers and to play with these the new properties of this system. Uh, uh, you can prepare the ultra thin layers, of course, from a, a, top, a bottom up approach, but as I not use this, I will not tell you about that. But we can use also the most common top down methods that consist of you take the bulk stacked layers and you separate them. Or by dry methods, that is with a sticky tape that peel off a uh, multi layer, so you get few layers or single layers and you can deposit it on a substrate, then you have high quality layers. But you can also use wet methods that in this case only by mechanical forces like sonication, uh, you can separate the layers or you can do chemical or electrochemical approaches to introduce molecules or ions in between the layers before applying the, the external the mechanical forces. So the, the material is expanded and it's easier to delaminate it. In this way, what we obtain is an ink in different solvent. So for some things like preparing materials, it's more useful to use the wet methods. <clears throat> but why, which properties of molybdenum disulfide are interesting for us and why we want to use it? 
So molybdenum of the sulfide, as other transition metal decalcogenides, can be presented in different polytypes, different structural orders, let's say. The most important for molybdenum disulfide are the 2H phase or polytype and the 1T phase. There is a small uh, change in the, if we go directly to the inside each layer, there is a small difference between the, the coordination of the molybdenum in the two phases. This is most change from a trigonal prismatic coordination to a hot octahedral coordination make the, the molybdenum disulfide layer have completely different properties. The 2H phase that actually should be called one, the 2H, yeah, should be called 1H if it's a single layer, but usually everyone use 2H, so I will call it 2H. So the 2H phase or polytype is a semiconducting system. So it means that it has an open banker and it presents also photoluminescence. So if we think about using it for preparing a field effect transistor or optoelectronic devices, we will need this polytype. However, the 1T phase the, in the octahedral coordination of molybdenum, what we observe is the band gap is closed. So we have a metallic behavior. It means that it's much more conductive and for, for, for example, a catalytic properties, it's much more convenient to have it in the 1T phase than in the 2H phase. For this, what is important is to control or be able to change from one phase to the other, that is called phase engineering. There are several different techniques to, to change from one to the other, but not our, most of them are not reversible. Like yeah, the 2H phase that I didn't say, but is the thermodynamically more stable phase. Uh, we, we find it like this in nature. And then if we do a chemical exfoliation with the intercalation, we have some kind of doping and we will get to the 1T. But then by heating, we can come back. But by cooling down, we don't go to the 1T, let's say. So there are different approaches to, to phase engineering, but most of them, as I told you, are not reversible, but there is one that is especially interesting, that is the strain, application of a strain, that is called strain engineering. With this, you can really control, not only to change from one age to one T, that is quite difficult, but to modulate the band gap of your material, that is very interesting. <clears throat> Uh, up to now, it had been different approaches to apply a strain on the molybdenum disulfide layers. It's like mechanical strain in a local position that modulates the lattice structure. And then this modulation, a small modulation in the lattice structure, do, uh, change the electronic and the optical band gap. And with this, we get finally different properties. So a modulation of, of the properties with the strain. But as I told you, these are this, this strain is induced on the externally on the, on the layer, like for example, with the chip of AFM or bending, if you put the molybdenum disulfide layer on top of a substrate that can be bent. But in this, in this scenario, the, what this can be really interested is to get a self-sustainable system, material itself, that a uh, material that can modulate itself the strain that, uh, that apply on the molybdenum disulfide. For this, we rely on the use of molecules. Uh, sure you have heard about this already. When we combine molybdenum disulfide with molecular materials, we prepare different kinds of systems called Van der Waals ether structure composites or mixed dimensional ether structures. You can find it in different, with different names, depending on the strength of the interaction and on the kind of molecular system. But the key point is that we, you can tune the properties of the 2D layer with the molecular system, and even you can get synergetics effects. So what we want is go one step forward and use a molecular material that is a molecular switch. You have heard this morning about this molecular switch, these alpha compounds that can change between two states with external stimulus. So thinking about a self-restrainable material, what we want is a molecular material that can induce different strain 
in different states of this, of this molecular system. So we control with external stimulus, the state of the molecular system and the strain that is applied, applied on the molybdenum disulfide. That is the idea. So with this, we will get a smart 2D material. For this, we, 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 we have our, our, our target molecular system that is a spin crossover uh, material. They are spin crossover material. In the first talk this morning, it was already explained. I'm sure you know more about this than probably me myself. That is that it is these compounds are coordination compounds that can change from two spin states uh, with external stimulus like temperature, light, pressure, and but uh, usually they are, they are iron coordination compounds, but they are cobalt and so on and other and. The thing, the interesting thing for us is that in the two different spin states, apart from having these different magnetic properties with a hysteretic behavior, there is a difference in the, in the length of the, the bond between the ligand and the metal. We, we hear about this today too. So this means we have different volumes of the material. So if we attach a spin crossover system on top of our molybdenum disulfide, um, a system that can change its volume, then it means that probably could apply a different strain depending on the spin state that it will have. So we have uh, choose we have chosen our, our molecular system that is a, a most one of the most common is iron triazole uh, coordination compound prepared as nanoparticles with a silicon oxide uh, shell that will help not only to, to make it more stable, but also for anchoring it to the surface of molybdenum disulfide. And uh, it, it changes with temperature at above room temperature. So this would be after important for us, I will explain you. And now we need to prepare our molybdenum disulfide. So we, we, we use the chemical exfoliation by, with butyl lithium. It means that after the exfoliation, we have an acute suspension uh, with a one T phase, one T polytype. It is highly conductive, no bang up, uh, but it's negative. The, the, the layers have a, a, have, are partially reduced, so they, they have a negative charge and are, are much more reactive. So, we, there, is, there are different strategies to functionalize molybdenum disulfide uh, with soft interactions like electrostatic interactions, but also with more specific functionalizations. For example, if we can fill the empty vacancies of sulfur with thiols or the one that we are most commonly using that is an electrophilic attack from the pair of electrons of the sulfur that are not bonded. To, to electrophiles like uh, uh, the azonium salt or, uh, or allogen, uh, allogenized molecules. And with this, we create new covalent bonds. So this is, uh, the, I will explain you that, that the processes that we follow to prepare our, uh, our heterostructure or a self sustainable heterostructure. So we have chemically exfoliated molybdenum disulfide, we use the nucleophilic attack to this uh, iodine tri uh, prop uh, propyl trimethoxysilane molecule. So with this, the iodine will disappear and we will create a new covalent bond between the sulfur and the carbon. And we will get molybdenum disulfide decorated with trimethoxysilane groups. That is important because the trimethoxysilane groups will covalently attach to the silicon oxide shell that is surrounding our spin crossover nanoparticle. So uh, step by step, let's say, first we, we make the covalent functionalization with the trimethoxysilanes, and we observe the, in the DLS and the theta potential measurement that the charge of the layers has decreased considerably. That is a, a proof or a, one of, in, it's indicative at least that it has been a covalent functionalization of the material. If we go to the TM, the, the transmission electron microscope, after this is before the functionalization, after the functionalization, we detect that there is 
uh, silicon on the surface of our layers, but there is no iodine. It means it's the, the, it, this living group has gone as expected. And that what was more surprising for us, and it was not expected, but you, because usually what well, is not reported in this way, is that after the covalent functionalization, we observe phase transition from the 2H, from the 1T polytype that we have in chemically exfoliated molybdenum disulfide to 2H phase. This means in the Raman spectra, we had these peaks that are called G peaks that are characteristic of the 1T phase. And after the functionalization with the three methoxycylase molecules, the G peaks disappear. And if we look at the photoluminescence, we observe that photoluminescence is recovered. It means the vanguard has been opened. If we go to XPS analysis, uh, that with this, we can also um, uh, prove that the, there was this phase transition with the shift of the binding energies of molybdenum and sulfur that support the, this idea of the phase change. And then we go to next step, the important one, that is to attach the nanoparticles on top of our molybdenum disulfide. As you see, after the, re the mixing the two compounds, we get the nanoparticles decorating the molybdenum disulfide. We play with nanoparticles of different sizes in different ratios. Okay? We can control the amount of particles surrounding the layers and uh, different sizes. After attaching the nanoparticles that is here, the black, the black curves, there is no more extra phase transition. So in, in Raman, photoluminescence is maintained, XPS also support this. So we can see that in our heterostructure, structure, what we have finally is molybdenum disulfide in the 2H phase, that means semiconducting behavior on an open backup. This, import, this is important because if we want to do, to play with a strain, it is nice to have an open backup to modulate it. So with this, let's go to the properties of the material that we have prepared. First of all, to prove that the spin crossover system still behaves as a spin crossover system, because if not, there is no point. Of and as you see in the squid measurements, magnetometry, the behavior is quite similar in the nanoparticles than in the in the uh, in the composite. And uh, we we the 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 spin transition temperatures from low spin to high spin and from high spin to low spin are almost the same. And this terrestrial loop, the, the white is more or less the same. So this is fine, it is stable once attached on the surface and all these chemical processes. But the most interesting part is in the conductive measurements. When we, when the tra when we measure the transport, these are the first are only spin crossover nanoparticles. And when we go, this is a different situation that in a single molecule, a spin crossover uh, molecule, uh, in a single measurement, uh, sorry, in a measurement of a single molecule, uh, because this was uh, the target in this morning, a single molecule, but we have crystals or nanoparticles, uh, uh, we observe always in the conductivity that the, from the lowest spin to the highest spin, we see a decrease in conductivity. And when we cool down and we go back from high spin to low spin, then the conductivity increase. In the heterostructure that we have, we observe the opposite behavior. It means that we start in a low spin state and when we heat, we observe an increase in conductivity. And then cooling down, sorry, cooling down, we get the reversal behavior and a decrease in conductivity. So the opposite behavior. This indicates that the spin transition is influencing the transport of the, of the material that we are measuring. And the, the, of course, there is also important thing that the, the conductivity is much better now in the composite because we have the molybdenum disulfide that helps for this. And we can, we can measure, we, we have measured the, the different composites with nanoparticles in different ratios. As the, the, as the nanoparticles are smaller, the effect is small, but smaller, but we can see it. But if we have too many nanoparticles, 
what we measure is only the behavior of the nanoparticles. It's the reverse behavior because transports go through the nanoparticles. If we have few nanoparticles, then we don't observe an effect of the spin transition in the transport measurements. So it seems that we're, with the spin crossover, the volume chains affect the band gap of our molybdenum disulfide because affect the transport properties. And one can, one can think uh, that maybe it's not that, that we are affecting the band gap, but we are, for example, moving the, the layers in between and changing the contact between them. So for this, what we thought was, let's go to measure uh, a direct proof of the modulation of the band gap. So we rely for this on photoluminescence. It's not exactly the electronic band gap, it's not the same like the, the optical band gap, but they are related. So we performed photoluminescence measurements to be sure that we are modulating the band gap of, uh, of molybdenum disulfide. For this, we go to the Raman spectrometer. We know that we can change the, the spin state of the nanoparticles by increasing the power of the laser that we use for measuring in the Raman spectrometer. And we do the same. If we do the same for molybdenum disulfide, we observe that the position of the photoluminescence of molybdenum disulfide, it doesn't change. Uh, the intensity changed, but we, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, normalized. So to, uh, to avoid this change in intensity, we are only focusing on the position of the photoluminescence that is directly re related with the, how, how is the size of the banga. And if we go to the composite, what we observe is like here, by changing the power of the laser, we really observe a, module, a change, a shift of the position of the photoluminescence. From the low spin state that we have small molecules to the high spin state that we have larger molecules, there is a, a decrease in the energy of the optical band gap. That means that the larger particles induce a strain and close a bit the band gap. So, this is like using light as an external stimulus to modulate, to apply the strain, but we can of course use temperature. So this is only the, the transition of the particles in the, in the range is a smaller range of the Raman spectra. And, uh, but the, we measure the composite is more difficult with, with, because with temperature, by increasing temperature, the intensity decreases a lot. But we observe that in the, the temperatures related with the spin transition, the shift of the position of the photoluminescence can be clearly observed. But the bad news are the molybdenum disulfide by, this, by itself also present this shift. So how can we really see that the, with the temperature, we are modulating, the, the, we are inducing this strain on the molybdenum disulfide? So the, the way to do it is to see, we know that the spin transition has aesthetic behavior. So let's see if we really are able to follow aesthetic behavior in the position of the photoluminescence in our composite. We did that and we clearly observed that we, we present, this is a, the, the position of the, the photoluminescence, how this shift present aesthetic behavior while molybdenum disulfide by itself is shift the, the position of photoluminescence, but doesn't present this aesthetic behavior. With this behavior, of course, we can play at the temperature that we are in the middle of the, uh, of the aesthetic loop and take one temperature at which we have the nanoparticles in two different spin states. So in this case, the shift of photoluminescence will be due only to the spin transition and not to the temperature. And from there, we can strain, uh, extract the detensive strain related with this shift of phot in the photoluminescence. So, with this, only to this aesthetic behavior was a proof the fingerprint that the molybdenum disulfide is really influenced by the spin transition in the attached nanoparticles. And before all more all and more details are can be found in the in this paper. But of course, what I want to thank is Ramon Torres that really 
fight with these systems since the beginning and also prepare these nice pictures like this one and, and others. And, and Mark Moran that was working with in the exfoliation of molybdenum disulfide and Marta with the electronica properties, but also of course a bunch of collaborators what is was impossible to do the, this work without them. But before I write it to it, I, I, I have passed my time already. No, it's uh, 25 minutes, yes. Yeah, okay. But one, only one thing to show you before the conclusion is that we usually we can, I have been talking on in solution, but we can do these kind of things on surface too. This is chemically exfoliated molybdenum disulfide but deposited on a surface. This is mechanically exfoliated molybdenum disulfide. But we, in this case, we can grow all the kind of spin crossover system, like for example, this Hoff, Hoffman type coordination polymers that grow, grow in a layer by layer way. So this was made in gold, but uh, it can be done also on top of molybdenum disulfide. You can follow the growth and you can see the, the spin transition is still alive. And this is other work uh, that is going on. And with this only to arrive to the conclusion that I hope I show you that with the, with the molecules we can play to, we can play a lot on 2D materials. We can use them as tool to modulate the two dimensional system. And if we have a spin crossover molecules, they are even more interesting to create a smart material. And Thanks a lot to the people that is currently working still with this, with the spin crossover and with the 2D materials and inside Eugenio Coronado Group, as you know, and the new people arriving to in the master, all the group. And actually, Ramon is not, I should remove the picture, but <laughs> Ramon is also with, is now with Lapo. And so enjoy Ramon Lapo because it's a diamond. And thanks all of you for your attention. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Alicia, for, for this uh, talk that introduced also the 2D materials for tomorrow. But well, today is also a talk that is giving uh, some perspective about the spring crossover use for as a, an ele a molecular element to introduce a strain in, a, in any kind of material. Very strong strain in comparison with other materials that are more solid state materials. Okay, then now it's time for questions. Yeah. Thank you, Alicia, for the very nice talk. Uh, I have one question. Well, it's more or less one comment, uh, the interaction between your, your system with the, with the polymer, with the, with, the, with the sulfur is basically a strictly a quite a weak interaction. One option should be to, to include some substituents in the, in the triazole in order to improve the strength of, of, of the interaction because right now, basically you have a uh, like a very weak hydrogen bond with the sulfur, I guess, no? Which is the interaction in, that you have really in this system. With, with the nanoparticles? Yeah, 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 yeah. With the nanoparticles, actually we have a, a, a bridge that is a covalent bond because the, the triazole molecules is inside. We have a thin layer of silicon oxide around. Ah, okay, okay, so okay. So the, the trimetoxicillin covalently bond to the silicon oxide. And then with the other part, we create a covalent bond from the, with the okay. sulfur. So we, we have covalent bridges. Okay. Uh, and the, when we play with directly with bare uh, spin crossover, then the direct, uh, the, the, the direct attachment, let's say, is a bit difficult because the solvents sometimes are not so compatible and this. So for this, the, to have a silicon oxide shell, is, is really good, not only for the anchoring, but also for the stabilization of the spin crossover system. Okay, but you have always this uh, silicon oxide. Uh... In the, with the nanoparticles, yes. Okay, okay. Uh, but we, we, we check it that the, as, uh, the, the, the change in volume, even with this, that is not really, I painted like a thick layer, but this thin layer and the, the change in volume is not affected. So that the system still can change. But then there is a transmission of the change of the, of the spring crossover system 
through the, this uh, uh, silicon oxide layer to, to, the, to the material. The, the silicon oxide layer and the spin crossover, yeah. let's say, all is together. You the, they change it's together. together. Okay. Change the volume. I see. And then I, you can paint it like, I paint it like a nanoparticle, a bridge, and um, the molybdenum disulfide here, but actually this is not rigid. So they are covalent bonds, but they are in direct contact with the sulfur molybdenum disulfide because the, the molecules with three carbons are then, uh, they, we don't know exactly how it is, but it is direct contact. Okay, okay. Yeah, thank you very much, very nice talk. Uh, in fact, my question was uh, something uh, similar because, uh, so uh, first of all, uh, how is the, uh, the amount of material that, that you are introducing by functionalization? Do you have an idea of uh, how many groups are you introducing? The, the, With the functionalization of the marine functionalization is like, uh, the, it's a kind of a, 10, 50% of the sulfurs of the are functionalized, let's say. You mean with the covalent bond? Yeah, with the molybdenum disulfide. That yes, is. yes. But actually, the nanoparticle that has a size of uh, 40, it doesn't mean that one molecule get one nanoparticle on top, because a nanoparticle is 40 nanometers length or 70 nanometers length. So in your flake, you can, and the flake is not on a substrate is straight like that. So it, it can bend, it's like grab the particles. So we get more nanoparticles than the, the, num the number of than the numbers because these are like isolated, yeah. but it, the, it's, as I tell you, when you prepare the temp, the layers are more extended, let's say, but when you are in the solution, like they cannot bend and you have also the molecules on top and on the bottom. Yeah. In the time you you see through, but you you have the functionalization also the ratio of molecules in the edges and in the defects increases, so you get more particles also there. Yeah, because I was wondering if you really need the, that functionalization. To the have, covalent attachment. Yeah, the, yes, the, the the initial functionalization of only the to have uh, the this uh, the nanoparticles inside. You yeah. can make a mechanical mix of nanoparticles of molybdenum disulfide, but then we, we have done it. But then we don't observe the, 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 in the transport measurements, for example, we don't observe, we observe the, 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 the change of the spin crossover, the conductivity of the spin crossover nanoparticles in much higher conductivity because we have the, like a bender that is the molybdenum disulfide around, but I guess they get, a kind of uh, distributed. The nanoparticles prefer to be together. The molybdenum disulfide prefer to stack together and not really a homogeneous decoration of the particles around. So by mechanical, no, not mechanically solid, but mixing it without getting a, a direct uh, attachment or fusionalization of the molecules to the flakes, we cannot control that the, this strain induced on the layers. We need a homogeneous a coverage of the okay we'll of the the, uh, later thank you thank you Okay, no, well, what is important here is, uh, well, we finish with this discussion, but what is important is that the covalent uh, interaction between the nanoparticles and the surface is, the, is essential to have this strain effect. If you do that without this uh, kind of uh, uh, link that is a stronger chemist we can tune from Van der Waals to covalent bonds, we cannot observe the strain effect. For example, if you try to do that with uh, even with uh, this system or with graphene, if you do that with graphene, with the small layers of graphene, you don't observe anything. You need to have, in that case, CBD graphene that is quite extended. And after there, you, you observe some effect even with if you have this kind of Van der Waals interactions. But for having any effect on graphene, for example, of these nanoparticles, you need to attach them directly to the surface. Then. And this is one thing that is and interesting. Because also we are dealing with a powder, with a material, let's say, not on the surface. If you have only the, the layer on the surface, but if you have it like in a suspension or in a powder, then, then they will not be well distributed. I think it's important to have them like well all on top and on the bottom, not 
aggregates of nanoparticles on one side and layers on the others. Okay, then I think that is clear. Then now, thank you, Alicia.